All right, welcome everyone to the first Science Circle talk of the decade of 2020. Hope you're all excited to listen and hear about some of the exciting stuff that actually happened last year. But of course, this is an ongoing area of development that is genome editing. So what we talk about today will really, in many ways, be about the future of the technology for us. My name is Stephen Gazier. Uh, here I am in Second Life as Stephen Zootfly. My job in real life is I'm a senior research associate at, at Corteva AgroSciences, specifically working in the, uh, basically the technology development area specific to genome editing, as well as plant transformation. So that's my background and what I find also interesting and what I really liked about preparing a talk about CRISPR in 2019 in general, is going, stepping a little bit outside of my narrow area of research to tell you about the things that are exciting. Now, some of this might be biased towards the things that I think are most important, but I've tried to make it uh, what I think really are the highlights of 2019 in genome, genome engineering. So with that said, I'll get started with my talk uh, after one brief mention that of course, a disclaimer, I am a researcher at a company that is involved in this area of research, trying to commercialize or related to commercialization of products. Uh, so just understand that potential bias. And then I'm not here representing the company's positions. I'm not here as some sort of delegate or official capacity for the company. The opinions I express will be my own. And then additionally, nothing that I talk about today should be construed as investment advice or forward-looking statements for the company or even kind of maybe some of the other research that I'm talking about that does have commercial interests. Again, if you go investing, putting stocks in these companies, don't blame me. There are other things going on. So the basic structure of my talk is I'll give a reminder about the background of how genome editing works. And then I'm going to talk about, I think, some of the most interesting uh, likely impactful technology advances. Talk about some of the new tools that have occurred. So people are very focused on something known as Cas9. You always see Cas9, but there's actually other stuff going on in bacteria that we can take advantage of for genome engineering. There's a little bit of, uh, we're gonna to touch upon a little bit of some new developments in intellectual property and ethics. And then uh, finally, the bulk of the talk will be talking about, I think the most interesting development we have right now, which is the, the initiation of clinical trials for therapies using CRISPR-Cas9. So that'll be pretty exciting. Uh, I'm, get, I'm kind of moving away from talking about some of the model genes and model organism research that's happened. There's been a lot of great stuff going out there, going on out there in terms of other genes targeted, stuff going on in mice or other organisms. Uh, and maybe we'll come back to some of those in the future. Anyway, with that being said, I also want to just make a point about the way I've structured this talk, which is in order to be faithful to the research that was published or maybe press releases, I've included a lot of text from the original publications or press releases. Do not feel obligated to read those on the slides, and I will be highlighting the things that are probably you know most important. Um, that's There's a PDF that will be on the website that you can always go through those more carefully. Uh, and then the other thing to keep an eye out for is if you see some green text, those are kind of my upshot take home lessons for any given slide. So if you wanna focus on those two, that is just fine. All right, so as a reminder, and if you look at this slide, this is a review from Jeffrey Doudna, one of the developers of the important technology of CRISPR-Cas9. And what I wanna highlight here is just the basic idea that on the left-hand side, you see a gray outline of the protein Cas9, and what it's doing is clamping around some target DNA, and that target DNA is in black. And what's also in this complex is a blue piece of RNA, and this is what binds the RNA to the Cas9, and then associated with that is this red RNA known as the spacer. And what the spacer plays an important role in doing is guiding this gray protein to that 
black DNA. And so what you'll notice is that the black DNA, the black strands are split into two, and then the red is hybridizing. In other words, the bases of the RNA are pairing with the bases of that target DNA, and that's what allows us to specifically locate to a specific sequence or location in a genome. And then you can do stuff. So classically, the Cas9 in and of itself contains an endonuclease activity, and that's why it's showing little scissors on the diagram, and that you can cut DNA and then things can happen. We'll talk about that. Now, one of the other developments that has that was discovered a few years ago is that Cas9 is not the only protein that does this that are derived from bacteria. There's something known as Cas12A, which you may have heard called CPF1. Same basic idea though, you have RNA hybridizing to DNA, and then that's cutting some location in the genome. And then on the right is another category of these enzymes that actually doesn't target DNA, it actually targets RNA. And so the ability to uh, do this type of editing, you don't necessarily have to target the genome, you can actually target the messengers of the information. And in some applications that might be useful or also allay fears about genome, you know, germline editing. So um, what are the things that scientists and researchers have decided to do with this? And, oh, sorry, let me make one other statement that the reason bacteria have these, it's it's an immune system. And what's really unique about this type of immunity for bacteria is that they can develop a memory for things they've seen before. And that's a very powerful thing. Like our, if you've had a vaccination, you typically don't get infected by that thing again. And so uh, the same idea happens with bacteria. And so these are exquisite. And the best way to defend yourself from viruses is by just cutting their DNA or RNA. Now, again, continuing from the same review, Dalna describes how the things that we can do to target that, um, target some sort of effect in a target organism or cell, is that again, cutting is something that makes sense. There's also this other category of things developed uh, by David Liu and some others at, at Harvard, where instead of cutting DNA, they make small mutations that then get repaired in a way that's different than what you had before. So that's called base editing. You can also uh, locate genomes by lighting them up with, uh, with GFP, green fluorescent protein. You can also turn genes on and off. If you take out Cas9's cutting activity and then put other things on it, like transcriptional activators or transcriptional repressors, you can turn genes on or off. And again, you can do some of the similar types of things with RNA as a target. Now, Vic asks uh, a little bit of a side question. I'll address it, which is when, he, which he asks, how do they store that memory information in their DNA? And that is correct. What they do is when they find a foreign invader, not only do they chop it up in order to inactivate it, they also take a couple pieces of it and basically take that sequence and re-encode it back in their own chromosome as a part of the CRISPR locus in order to then re-recognize it and have that always available. Again, I don't wanna to go through too much of, of the bacterial part of this because we have so much exciting stuff to talk about with the clinical trials. So the, now this is a, a review from Platt who, uh, is describing, reminding us how we think about genome editing with Cas9. And there are two ways that we've been doing this in general, which is one, to let Cas9 make a double strand break and then either let the host organism repair it in a way that you create mutations, which again, it's very hard to direct the types of mutations that occur. And sometimes these are just small deletions. Sometimes they can be small insertions of just a few nucleotides, a couple bases, a couple A's, G's. But we can also provide a template. And that's what you see in this red DNA is the ability to say, well, we want some other different sequence in this location and then insert that. The problem with that is that in general, it's very inefficient. Now there have been some developments that might find a way to make that happen a little bit more efficiently in certain types of cells. But for right now, doing this uh, insertion or HDR-based repair is not something that we see in particular in the clinical trials right now. And as I mentioned earlier, this idea of base editing. And what the idea here is you 
basically take cast nine instead of something that can make a double strand break into something that can just make a nick. It only cuts one of the two strands of the target DNA. And then it, you also add what's called a deaminase. And deaminases are something that say, well, if you have um, an adenine, again, the base pair A, uh, you, or you basically cut it out, sorry, an amine, you cut it out, and then other repair processes come in and switch it to a different base. And this is, again, taking advantage of the repair processes that happen in the host organism. So you notice here they're showing you can take um, a G on the top strand and convert it to an A. Now that, again, is also not particularly precise. It's not particularly always the same sequence, but it, it does work relatively efficiently. And the other important thing about base editing is it avoids making double strand breaks, which can have, if misrepaired, very bad consequences for the cell. And so again, in these types of strategies where you're taking cells out of a patient, trying to do genome editing and then put them back in, then this is maybe in certain ways less precise what you wanna do, but also less dangerous. Now, this is a new development, and this was, uh, the review covers this paper from uh, Platt et al where they basically, oh, sorry, from uh, Anzalone et al, that, but this diagram start, describes a little more nicely, where instead of just trying to cut or nick DNA and let the guide is, um, is to include on that RNA that's attaching to the Cas9, is to also include a reverse transcriptase. And what reverse transcriptase does is it takes an RNA sequence and converts it back into a DNA sequence. And this is something where if you know about, you know, human immunodeficiency virus, that goes around infecting cells as RNA, but it encodes reverse transcriptase so it can turn into DNA and then incorporate into, and then become like a permanent part of target cells. And so using the same idea is that if you include this red template sequence, as a part of your RNA, the reverse transcriptase can come in, and then because of the way the Cas9 is making NICs, and because of the way cells prefer to repair these types of extra sequences, you can actually code for a specific repair process, a particular outcome that you see in red. And so, again, in summary, what we saw in the previous techniques is you, you are likely to get outcomes from the activity of Cas9 that you can't control. And the main idea here is that now you can actually frequently control the outcome of the edit. Uh, so again, Vic asks a good question about, you know, what environment does this all take place in the lab of safety protocols? Yes, you know, anything that, uh, any lab that's ordering supplies or getting money from granting agencies go through and have safety protocols. There are institutional review boards and institutional, you know, health and safety uh, committees that cover all this type of thing. And, and so this is, so this technique is called prime editing. So the idea that you can prime off the RNA and, and determine the outcome. So here's, uh, you know, just one quick slide from the original paper. I don't want to overwhelm you and you don't need to read this in too much detail up close, but what I want to demonstrate from this paper, and this is what I have written in green is that if you have any base close to your target sequence, which is a C, an A, a G, or T, you can turn that with pretty high frequency into any of the other three bases that you want. Uh, and that's kind of what that top graph is showing is that all those blue bars are demonstrating a pretty high efficiency where you're replacing one base with another. Uh, and then on the bottom, graph here, the, the slide F, what it's showing is actually doing more than just trying to change a base from one to another. It's actually inserting or deleting certain amounts of small sequences. And again, in certain types of editing situations where you maybe want to change a protein or some target gene, those types of changes are more important than, than a single substitute. So any, any quick this is a good place to pause because I think prime editing is a great time to, to say, we found a way to more precisely make the changes we want. So any questions about this so far?
All right, so everyone's feeling pretty good that they're understanding the base, the base concept of what's exciting about prime editing. All right, great, then we will move on. So throughout all of the development of CRISPR-Cas9 technology, this idea that you can hybridize and target a particular sequence, one big question, and something that has been observed, is you can accidentally target and have outcomes at sequences that are similar to the one you're targeting, but are not the one you're targeting. And so, for example, if you have one or two base substitutions, Gs or As, you can actually end up targeting and breaking or editing some other gene or some other location of the genome. And that could be, again, white pathogen. So this is known as off-target off targeting. And so the, um, the data coming from this paper, this is something from, again, Young et al., which is actually my group at Corteva AgroScience. And the upshot here is showing that when you include Cas9 and target corn embryos, and then look at, actually sequence verify all of the other related sequences, that what you'll see in that green box is you get, again, in this particular situation with Cas9 being delivered as a protein, you get zero off-target effects. And I think that that's an important thing going forward when we talk about the safety or efficacy of Cas9 and genome editing is that we can be relatively sure that with certain conditions, they um, do not target other stuff. So again, there's a lot of conversation in the local chat about uh, the Chinese scientists who did genome editing. I will talk about that later. There was actually a December 30th outcome. So there's very recent data. I didn't even have it in my talk until I started preparing this just last week. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, so, but what was also interesting from this group in looking at corn embryos and targeting is in the next slide here with table three, is that if you do a very good job of picking a target site that has very few other off-target likely sites, again, there's a likelihood that an off-target site will be hit based on how similar it is to the original, that even with you know, basic vector-based expression of Cas9 in the guide that you still have zero off-targeting effect. And so I think this is a very important thing when we think about genome editing that, you know, it's actually much, a little bit safer than we thought as long as you're rationally designing your strategy. Uh, there's some, been some t similar techniques that was also published this year looking at base editing off-target effects. And so also in 2018, again, a little bit earlier, the end of 2018, so I actually kind of missed it when I was hitting the holidays, there was a very nice paper done in mice showing that off-targeting effects was relatively minimal in mice. So I think these are, um, again, kind of the new developments that we have at, that are, I think, the new technologies that we have that are actually pretty cool in the CRISPR-Cas9 area. All right, so moving on, CRISPR-Cas9 is not the only way that bacteria try and defend themselves. It's actually a relatively small percentage of these CRISPR systems. And so if you take a look at the top, le top left in the diagram in figure four, what you see there is this complex of blue, pink, green proteins along with an RNA. And what that actually represents is a protein complex known as Cascade. And that is a CRISPR system known as type one where there are multiple proteins that do the functions of going and finding, or, you know, finding the RNA, going to the target sequence, and then they separately recruit yet another protein in order to do the cutting in the natural bacterial systems. Okay, so what the Picker-Oliver group showed uh, is that if you take this complex, and add, as Doudna mentioned earlier, transcriptional activators, then you can turn on the expression of endogenous gene. And so that's what's shown in the graph below it is the basic outcome data where uh, if you're measuring the amount of expression of the ILN, ILL, IL1RN gene, you can actually get increased amounts of expression when you're specifically targeting its promoter. And so that is an exciting development, that we have other tools and techniques that allow us to do these types of homing in human cells. 
And then what's shown here on the bottom half and the bottom right-hand side, those little odd orange-shaped oblong things, those are corn embryos that you can dig out of a kernel. And then you can use gold particles accelerated at high velocity to deliver DNA. And so what you see on the right-hand side is using Cas9 with a gene activator to something that turns on a pigmentation gene. And what you see in the middle is that is also this cascade complex that, again, attached to various gene activators that um, also accomplish the same goal. And again, left-hand embryo, that's just a control showing that without these types of gene delivery systems, you do not have any activation of the pigment. So again, an exciting tool that we can use both in uh, you know, mammalian systems as well as, as corn. Uh, I'll pause because Vic asked the question, are we learning a lot more about turning on or off genes with CRISPR technology? And you know, it, this technology, because if you want to turn a gene on or off permanently, you'd also have to include that whole transgene and embed it and keep it turned on. So it's not, it's not a hot area of research for, say, gene therapy, because that becomes a transgenic. It's also, again, for um, plant-based agricultural products, also not a thing that people are, are focusing on. Uh, but it is a very powerful way to, to change stuff. And one thing that some people are working on are things that change the epigenetics of a target gene, so that maybe you can get some degree of permanence where you transiently change the promoter status and then you can turn it on or off. And so those types of ideas are being explored, but I wouldn't say that there's anything that, you know, is, is uh, you know, close to product development right now. But you can use that to learn very interesting things uh, about, about these systems, about target, target organisms. Uh, so again, uh, the work with the embryos, that's published by me uh, in my group just this year. So uh, again, that's turning genes on or off, but one of the other applications we're really interested in is the ability to, of course, make genetic changes to target chromosomes. And so two other groups uh, have also been working with these cascade complexes to accomplish the same thing. So the Dolan et al. group, they took this cascade complex and took its normal endonuclease, again known as Cas3, and put this into target uh, human cells. Now, the reason why Cas3 has not been um, really a focus of genome editing is because it just goes around being like a Pac-Man chewing along DNA. And that's what the diagram is trying to show here, too, is that Cas3, it jumps on, once it jumps on DNA is activated, it just chews it up. And so the ability to do precise genome editing is limited when you're letting Cas3 perform its normal activities that way. Uh, however, there are applications where this may be useful. And so, uh, again, they published that this works. And it's important to think that, hey, maybe if you can deliver and get this to work, there are other ways of, again, modifying target DNA, maybe base editors. Or... Uh, now, the Cameron et al. paper, and this is interesting, this is an older technology that's been around for a long time where they can use this dimerizing endonuclease known as FOC1, which I'll just spell in local chat as FOK1, where if you can provide these coming together on top of DNA, then they'll make cuts. And so what they showed was that with a cascade complex attached to FOC1, and then targeting some particular sequence, you'll see that the, the bars that are high up there, that's showing the editing efficiency of this type of complex. So again, this is an example where, again, maybe Cas3 is not, not gonna help you do what you wanna do, but being able to deliver a different type of endonuclease will help it work. And what's really interesting about this type of this type of technology is that because you're guiding cascade to different parts of the DNA, the sequence specificity is, you know, log fold higher than what you have with just a single guiding Cas9. And so that idea may be useful. And then just one other thing that, you know, we we may or may not see out of these systems is that because they're a large protein, there are lots of different ones involved. Maybe you can attach different types of moieties to do multiple things at the same time. So combinations of hypermethylation, transcription activation, uh, base editing, all at the same time. And so they're even though they're bigger and maybe less 
and maybe a little more unwieldy in terms of transgenics or other delivery systems, they may have other uses that you can't do with cat. So the other new technology that has come out is the discovery by two different groups with two different independent systems that transposons use CRISPR systems in order to jump around. So let me just mention that transposons are segments of DNA. They're also known as selfish genes or, sorry, uh, sorry, selfish DNA or junk DNA or mobile elements are different names for them, where they live in a genome, but they're more like parasites that are jumping around. And what the uh, Cloppy group at all demonstrated is that there's a naturally existing cascade complex that associates with, within the transposon and then uses its transposase, the enzyme that accomplishes transposition, to actually insert the transposon in other genomic locations. And so this idea means that maybe we can do payload delivery that's targeted. Again, we can exact the system from molecular biology to, in a more safe way, deliver payloads to particular genome locations. And so that would help avoid some of the dangers of making your canonical double strand breaks. Uh, and then there's another group that showed these single proteins, again, the CPFs, the Cas12s, accomplish the similar type of transposition. So again, a little more of a simplified system. Now, let me say the caveat to these, this is very exciting, uh, but the caveat is that this has not been demonstrated to work in eukaryotic cells yet. This so far right now is limited to prokaryotes. But again, something that is potentially very exciting and useful as we move forward. And then the final new tool, that was something that came out from, you know, Dowden associated researchers, is they went database searching for more Cas proteins. And one of the ones they found was this Cas14. That, um, oh, Vic, so you asked about junk DNA. Remind me at the end, because that's a little bit off topic. Uh, and I can't unfortunately go on too long about it. Uh, that these Cas14 proteins, they also perform CRISPR associated activities. And what they were able to show was that they could get single strand DNA cleavage with a guided RNA. And it was very efficient. And that's, again, what you're seeing here in terms of this diagram is the, um, the red bar, or so the red dots are representing single strand DNA cleavage. And so the y axis is how much of that is being cut up. And then the x axis is over time. And they're showing that in multiple ways with the graphs, and then they're actually showing the gels are showing that you have DNA that is a, um, a high molecular weight, and then with the activity of this protein, it turns it into a low molecular weight. So things that are lower or at the bottom of the gel are things that have run faster on the gel and are smaller. So again, demonstrating that this is, yet yeah, again, another protein that can accomplish these types of tasks. And then again, also, the uh, Vilnius University group, uh, Virginius Siskness, also basically found that when you take the same protein and find some slightly different conditions in which to, to incubate it, that it actually does also work as a double-strand DNA cleavage protein. So again, very similar to Cas9 in the sense that it targets DNA, you can guide it to a particular spot, and then makes a double-strand break. Now, what's most exciting about these really small double strand break effectors is that because they're so small, they can fit more easily in adenoviral vectors. And adenoviral vectors are really the most feasible way that right now we do DNA delivery in human cells. And so the Cas9 by itself is a pretty big protein and takes a lot of space on a vector in order to express it. And so um, the ability to, to do this with a smaller protein that Cas14 represents may allow more clinical applications. Um, so George, let me get back to your question a little bit later as well, because that uh, gets into a different different question about evolution and, and mutations. All right. Um, so that's kind of, I think, some of the interesting technology developments and the new tools that we have in this field. I'm gonna move on to, to the next half of the talk where 
the thing that almost always comes up when people are thinking about CRISPR Cas9 from a commercial from a, especially from a commercial point of view and how are these going to become clinical trials or how these become therapies or how are we going to use these for other types of things is the intellectual property space. And so right now, the Broad Institute, Feng Zhang as the inventor, are the ones that hold patents and the ability to license this for use in uh, commercial applications in eukaryotes. And, there, and I've talked about this in the past. There's been a, a history of UC Berkeley the Charpentier and Doudna groups that, you know, there's been a, an ongoing saga between the two of who actually owns it and from whom does any commercial entity need to get a license. And so there was an interference last year where Broad won and there was no declared interference. However, the U.S. Patent Office actually turned around this year and without, um, being prompted by any particular lawsuit or any particular court case decided to reopen the interference as related to a specific aspect of the technology. So one thing I've mentioned is that this RNA, you use RNA to guide the protein where you want it to go. And there are different ways to engineer that. It's, it's naturally a two-piece system, but what now Doudna demonstrated, and I think published first in eukaryotes, or sorry, in prokaryotes, in bacteria, was that if you can conjoin these together with an intermediate linker sequence, then it works better and that that is you know, feasible to do. And it seems like the interference has been reopened that in terms of using that aspect of the technology of doing this joined guide sequence, the single guide sequence, that uh, Feng Zheng may not have the novelty for that one. So, once we start talking legalese, I start getting lost. Uh, but let's just say for right now, in terms of the way most people use this technology, it's entirely possible that in the upcoming years, there'll be a new ruling that says the Doudna Group actually is the umbrella patent for the use in eukaryotes as well. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. And then of course, other news as was also kind of mentioned a little bit earlier in the chat is that this uh, Chinese researcher who performed genome editing in the embryos of two humans and then implanted them that led to live births, all right? So what we're talking about here is actual attempted germline editing of a couple's offspring, well, actually several couples, several couples offspring, in order to basically the attempt was to make them immune from HIV infection. And I, I've i talked about, you can go back and look at my old talk, my old presentations where talking about the details of the gene and what they tried to do, and maybe other larger thoughts on the ethics. But this was a development that just happened December 30th that uh, he was found guilty in a district court in China of being guilty of different crimes. And the crimes focus around the idea that he conducted this research poorly in terms of ethics, informed consent, and institutional review. And then maybe the larger broader category of saying that germline editing is not considered ethical by the science community. Uh, and that, again, the terminology of the quote here is that rashly applied genome editing. And I think it's very fair to say that if you look at the outcomes of his genome editing, that both of the individuals that were born ended up being heterozygous for the intended mutation. So as a treatment, it was not effective 100%. In fact, it's only 50% effective in terms of targets. And then in another sense, essentially 0% effective in terms of it being a useful way of being able to resist HIV infection. So I think that that is, would go into it as well. And I think fairly enough, a lot of researchers in the field have criticized him for it not per se being ready and being 100% effective. So anyway, I think that's a new development. You know, there's been a lot of talk this year and I've seen various headlines, but I didn't get into it for this talk of different scientific communities trying to really come up with what is the ethics of germline editing? And I think that that's going to be a big question. Maybe 
the 2020 year in review will have a, a better conversation about what people are doing and the decisions. Uh, I did see in the in the local text, I think also there's mention of a, a Russian, Russian researcher who went online to say, I'm going to do germline editing. Uh, but he actually, I think a couple months later said, look, the germline editing I'm talking about doing is with, re with scientific review, ethics review, the permission of my government. So uh, that made some headlines, but I think the follow-up to that was less sensational than expected. All right. So let's talk about the interesting gene targets. And so one of the things that made uh, the rounds, and this is probably something you may or may not have heard about, but definitely was making the rounds in, in the gene, genome editing community, was basically an oopsie. <laughs> and so uh, let me talk about what was attempted, what they were attempting to edit, which is cattle. And that is that normally when you have a, li a, a large herd of livestock, of cows and bulls, the fact that they have horns means that they can damage each other, they can damage the handlers. And so one thing that they typically do is remove them surgically at a young age. Now that's apparently not a comfortable process. It's considered inhumane by some people. And so the idea of genetically modifying them to not have horns in the first place would be a more humane way of doing this. And so there's a, a naturally occurring gene variant called POLT. That is, they, don't, they just are not born with horns. And so there were attempts to gene edit this, and this was actually published back in 2016. They were planning on trying to turn this into a, a breeding colony so that, you know, then the, the genome, the gene, the gene edit could be disseminated. So the first company that did this was Recombinetics. And then uh, the project was actually taken over by UC Davis. And so I have some uh, web links where you can get familiar with this background and everything. Now, what came out this year that was published in two different sources was somebody analyzing the, the publicly made available sequence of these individual, um, I think they were bulls. So, and what they showed here, and let me just say, let me walk you through this diagram for a second, which is that anytime you're trying to deliver a template, this is what I mentioned earlier on is that, you know, to actually put sequence in that you want, you have to add DNA to the whole, to the whole, the whole mix. And so on the left-hand side, what you see is a vector. And all this stuff that has an orange shade to it, that is backbone to the vector and not, that's bacterial sequence. And then you have the targeted integration you're trying to do, that's the other colors. In the middle, this is what a normal looking chromosome looks like that's not mutated. It's basically called the horned allele of, of the gene. And then what this group was finding was that on the right hand side, the ger, ger, uh, genome edited bulls were um, heterozygous. Now they both had the polled version of the mutation. So that on the left chromosome, you see up there, you see the gray, the green, the blue. And that's what you had from the delivery vector in one chromosome. And what that did was to basically recapitulate the natural mutation that led to this, this phenotype. But what you see in that little right chromosome is a whole bunch of orange sequence and then another copy of the green and blue. And so this is a, a very aberrant, unexpected repair outcome. But the significant difference in terms of that left chromosome being the intended edit versus the right chromosome is it becomes a transgenic animal. So the fact that there's foreign inserted DNA means that the regulatory process that these animals go through is vastly different than a regular genome edit in at least most countries and particularly in the US. And so that's one thing that people are very excited about with genome editing is that you can move away from a regulatory schematic where you're in, that you have to analyze inserted DNA from other organisms. And so that's, this is something that basically kind of powered through the community. Now I will say the UC Davis group also published in um, Nature Biotechnology, they were looking at the inheritance pattern of these chromosomes from a mating. And they were looking in the offspring and they did publish that there is this extra DNA, which was missed in the original 2016 publication. So this is not something that 
as far as I can tell, they were trying to hide. There were just some kind of minor experimental mistakes that were made. And these are difficult um, by the original, original group. So the thing that's important to recognize here is that when these types of mistakes can lead to additional scrutiny, but it's also very important to make sure that you do everything you can to confirm and very carefully detail the types of edits and changes that you're making. And so we might see some sort of additional regulatory scheme, even when what you're trying to do is not transgenic. It's your kind of accelerated breeding editing schematic, but you need to make sure it's not, other stuff hasn't happened. So that was kind of an important development this year. But, I'm oh, sorry, let me go back and say one thing that there are several examples of livestock, both in terms of cattle that are more heat resistant, uh, there's also trying to um, keep pigs from hitting puberty in order to remove pig taint from pork. But these are, this is a very active area of interest of trying to genetically modify livestock in order to, again, become a better product or to make the handling and the growth and the humanity, the, you know, how humane we treat them uh, better. Through okay, so let's talk about the final part which are, there are several clinical trials that um, have been published and talked about in the United States and Europe. Uh, there, a quick caveat that I do know of clinical trials that have been initiated in China for a variety of different diseases that involve CRISPR-Cas9, but they're kind of hard to track down and to really be able to say much about exactly what they're doing. So just to say that, let me just say that this is an interesting year for clinical trials, but we'll be focusing on what's happening in US and Europe. Okay, so uh, the link that I have on here, uh, which again, the PDF, this will all be made available on the website to make it easier to get to these particular links. Uh, it gives a nice overview of these different clinical trials for this year, but I'll go through them in more detail. So the first one is sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. So, you know, for, for us to be large organism, large organisms, we need to be able to transport oxygen very efficiently and to pick up carbon dioxide very efficiently and basically dispose of that. And so hemoglobin is this incredibly fine tuned molecule that accomplishes this very exquisitely and very well. And if you have a sickle cell mutation, what that is is a single amino acid that changes how the protein folds, which also then changes how the whole red blood cell folds and can lead them getting stuck in small capillaries, joint pain, and then inefficiency at delivering oxygen. People with this disease without medical intervention typically die at a young age. And there's also beta thalassemia, which is mutations in the beta chain of, of hemoglobin that also lead to similar types of inefficiencies in delivery of oxygen. Again, I'm not as familiar with the um, um, all the clinical presentations of beta thalassemia. Now, these are both relatively common diseases because they provide some degree of resistance to malaria. And so these are things that have naturally developed in, in areas of the world, like in Africa and the Mediterranean, where malaria is spread and is relatively common from mosquitoes. Now, anybody who, um, has had a child <laughs> or has born a child in their body uh, has realized that there's a lot of extra things you need to do to deliver food as well as oxygen to, to the, the developing fetus. And one thing that has occurred in the development is that the ability for the fetus to capture oxygen from the host mother means they have a different variation of hemoglobin known as gamma hemoglobin or fetal hemoglobin that's even that's good at grabbing the oxygen from normal adult hemoglobin. And so that's very important for developing embryo to get enough oxygen. Now, what's been shown is that if you overexpress gamma hemoglobin in people who have beta thalassemia, you actually have some degree of resistance to the disease, to, or the symptoms of um, the beta thalassemia. And there are actually some natural variants of this disease that have occurred. So, uh, one thing I want to point out is that the clinical trials right now, they're trying to um, alleviate sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia, are not trying to correct the gene that's missing. They're trying to overexpress a complementary thing 
that is expressed in developing. They're not actually attacking the gene itself. So here's the basic press release from Vertex um, webpage. And basically, again, we're talking about phase one clinical trials. So phase one means they're really just making sure that the treatment is not toxic and that uh, nobody's, that the treatment is not worse, sorry, that the treatment is not worse than the disease you're trying to treat. And so, um, But at the same time that you're doing these phase ones, you can also get some degree of clinical indications on a few patients that are being treated, that are being treated. And so what they were showing is that consistent with what's been seen for people with natural mutations that lead to gamma hemoglobin being expressed, they're actually seeing alleviation of the symptoms in a couple of patients already. And let me go through the, I'll go through a little bit of the, the science background of how this particular genome edit is working, which is in this diagram, the, the small blue boxes on the left are the genes for gamma hemoglobin. And the orange is the beta chain. And these different blue boxes underneath this are naturally occurring deletions in the genome in, uh, again, what's called, sorry, let me go back to this, the whole term. Um, it's called adult persistence of fetal hemoglobin. I think it's the disease, something along that, that name. Oh yeah, persistence of fetal hemoglobin. That's what it's called, persistence. So when this segment of DNA gets deleted, what's actually occurring, and you see this in the very bottom diagram, is that the red enhancers, the things that help exp that, that make genes get expressed at a high level, actually get closer to the gamma hemoglobin. And so the gamma hemoglobin is getting expressed at a high level, even in the absence of the beta hemoglobin. And so the basic idea here is that you can do a gene therapy in target cells where you purposely delete intervening sequences in order to get the gamma hemoglobin to get it overexpressed. Now there's other companies that have strategies where they're trying to turn off the repression of gamma hemoglobin that occurs naturally. Uh, but that I don't think has hit, actually hit the clinical trials as of yet. So again, an interesting strategy of trying to delete DNA in order to help express a gene as a therapy. Now this other one, this is coming out of University of Pennsylvania that has a long history of trying to use immunotherapy to treat cancer. And again, here's your long text, here's your long press release where I didn't, I wanna have this as a part of the talk. You don't have to read it at all. But what they're also doing is with this therapy they already have, they're adding CRISPR to make it more effective. All right, so again, this is one idea where the, the therapy, the gene therapy that's already been developed already has gone through a regulatory process where they know it works, just they want to enhance its effectiveness. And this is known as CAR-T. So T cells that are chimeric, they've had, they've had other genes added onto them or other, and what they're doing is they're encoding the T cells to recognize the cancer. Again, there's some sort of protein on the surface of the cancers that's important and then you're saying, hey, T cells, this is your enemy, go attack them, destroy them, and thus destroy the target cancer. And so this is the basic idea of the therapy. Now, the reason it hasn't been as effective as one would hope is that there are other things that regulate T cell activity. And so one of these things is a, a protein on the surface of T cells known as PD-1. And what happens is cancer cells can typically have a receptor on their cell surface that interacts with PD-1 and then tells the T cell to not engage in immune action. And so this is a diagram from, uh, again, Rupp et al., which again, part of the, the people working in CAR-Ts, where showing this in a mouse model, a xenotransplant type thing, this is where you put human cancer cells in a mouse and then try and do therapy on that to see what, see as a model system, that you'll notice in the blue bars, or sorry, the ability to, um, what's known as the tumor burden, which is another way of describing the size of the tumor, that the pink bars, where you have the tumor cell able to shut down the T cell, that burden increases. But if, you have T, but if you've deleted the ability of the tumor cell to interact with T cells this way, then you notice the black bars, the tumor burden is low. 
And so the idea here is that for the CAR T cells that the UPenn clinical trials are delivering, they're deleting out the PD-1 from those patients. And this is an important thing. The reason why this is an immunotherapy, let's just go back to this diagram, you're taking an individual's cells out of their body, messing with them, and then putting them back in. And this is a way to make sure you avoid lots of immune responses that the patient might have. Okay, and then the final clinical trial, this is something known as Lieber congenital amaurosis, which is basically a neuropathology in retinas, where basically it leads to blindness. Now, there's a whole host of genes that are related to this, but the most predominant one is something known as LCA10. And so um, Allergan, again, if you have contact solutions or looked at that in the grocery store, Allergan is a, is a name you might recognize. Then Editas Medicine, in collaboration of people who were the early developers of mass technology. They're targeting this because what's interesting about it, it's, the, it's really the first clinical trial of trying to deliver CRISPR-Cas9 materials directly to the tissue and then trying to edit it and, and have a, a clinical outcome. And so uh, this diagram here explains the strategy. And so the reason that people have a mutate, the types of mutations that people have in this LCA10 gene is they have some sequences between exons that cause aberrant splicing. So I don't want to go through too much detail of how you know, central dogma of DNA works, but it, when you're making an RNA, you have to, you're making a bigger RNA than you need, then you specifically chunk it off in a way to give you a protein coding sequence. And if that process goes wrong, where you have either additional or missing splicing, you know, the, the way you're joining the components together, you don't get the right protein. And so the strategy here is to deliver, R, is to deliver Cas9 and try and edit these mutations that lead to the splice site. And so there are actually lots of ways. You can try and delete that sequence. You can just try and modify that sequence. Uh, you can do a template-based repair, different ways to try and modify this splice site and get rid of it. And then that way you get the normal gene and protein being expressed. And so uh, that's what their strategy is. And it's also in clinical trials. And they've shown that it is so far efficacious. All right. And then the final, um, again, this is a non-human application of genome editing technology. Again, this is not a CRISPR-Cas9. This is a Talon, but it's related, where the, the big goal here now, or the big point, is that there are now people eating and ingesting uh, from a commercially available source, again, gone through proper commercial channels, is um, high oleic soybean oil used in cooking. And so there's this group, um, Calixt is a Minnesota-based company that has, that was founded by the person who developed a Talon editing process, a guy by the name of Dan Boitas. And they've used this to edit a gene, which we'll talk about in a second, where high oleic soybean oil basically has all these great advantages where you can use it to fry multiple times, it has a longer shelf life, you cause less um, residue buildup on the cooking utensils. And so um, they, they are really the first ones to have made a product and put it into the food chain, where again, there are some restaurants that are using this in their cooking oil. And so it really marks, I think, a unique landmark of edited products getting into the food chain. Now, one reason why this has not been you know, huge and big news I think is because this idea of high oleic soybeans uh, is an old thing. There actually are transgenic GMO versions of these that various companies sell that have gone through the regulatory process. So it's not like it's a new product class. It's just been done in a different way. But it's, again, I think still an important point to mark. Now, how did they accomplish this, this um, edit? Again, this is showing the process where oleic acid is converted by a dehydrogenase to linaic acid. And they're basically targeting the FAD2 gene, again, the different variations, the two different copies of it in the genome, and just basically um, mutating out its ability to catalyze this process. And so, uh, you know, something that CRISPR-Cas9 could also do, but they, for intellectual property reasons, they have the rights to Talon, and so they performed it this way. Again, I presume they even started it before CRISPR Cas9. Anyway, so 
those to me, I think that's the CRISPR 2019 year review. I think to to talk about it, it was an exciting year for, I think, the consumer slash patient in terms of these things entering the larger cultural and um, economic realities and frameworks we have on the planet. Uh, there's lots of new tools that I think are going to be interesting, and we'll see, uh, again, right now, the things we target and the things we want to change are based on no mutations that occur and finding a way to do the same thing. And so I think the future will find maybe different ways of accomplishing those types of things. So any, so I'm going to go back and look at the local chat for the, the pre, uh, recent questions. Um, thanks, I'm glad everyone enjoyed it, listened. And I'm going to find that there's one question I saw, and then, then I'll take other questions from local chat. Uh, let me, before we go on, let me thank Chantel and others for helping um, host this. Looking forward to a great 2020. Okay, so George had a question. George Newberry asked, is this also where a mitochondrial transplant might come in, assuming I'm in the right part of biological science? Uh, let me say there are attempts and ways to edit mitochondrial as well as chloroplast genomes. Um, you know, I haven't seen a lot of stuff in terms of human patient therapies. There are mitochondrial-based diseases that are out there that might be worthwhile to target. I'm not really very familiar with, with a lot of those. But I think it's, it's feasible, and there are some people working on it. Now, there's another older question about, I think, genome <sighs> mutations and variation. Like something about how do we know mutations, or can we use Cas9 to discover stuff? Okay, whoever did that is going to have to repeat it, because I've scrolled back and I'm missing a lot of conversation. <laughs> um, all right, so George asks, um, might these CRISPR edits cause mutations in humans? And I presume you're talking about off-target mutations. And, you know, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that people are showing that CRISPR-Cas9, when engineered well and correctly, has very few off-target effects. And we always can track those down and discover them. And so, you know, it's a possible ability. But in terms of getting through therapies, regulatory frameworks, we have ways to help get away from that. Uh, Edgar asks if you can have my slides. They will be posted to the Science Circle website. Chantel will put out, I think, links for that and let people know. Um, Vic has a link to the Harvard talk about CRISPR-29. Uh, Wired guide to CRISPR is out there in the local chat. Um, so Adriel asks a question. What is the relationship between CRISPR-Cas on the one hand and programmed cell death and microbial dormancy on the other hand? Um, you know, the, the question I think is connecting things that I'm not sure are, are being actively investigated. And I'm not sure they're per se relevant. One could use CRISPR-Cas to initiate programmed cell death. Um, and I'm not sure what you mean by microbial dorm dormancy. Maybe, maybe you can rephrase the question. Now, Arian, Ariana asked an interesting question, which is, is it possible to kill bad mosquitoes with genetic engineering? So I did talk about that before, last year when we talked about CRISPR, uh, or maybe it was 2016 when I talked about this one. There are these things known as gene drives, and you can actually, there actually have been trials and people setting up, trying to destroy mosquitoes, by using gene drives where you get males that are born, but they're always infertile. So you basically can induce a population crash because the few males that are born, the males, again, they're not the ones who bite you and transmit the disease, but they can crash populations by ultimately not having any offspring. And the few offspring that are born are males that are infertile, but then do breed and then waste the uh, female mosquito's time. I think, and that's that's a very active area of, of research. Okay, so yeah, Vic is um, reposted in local chat. Is one question about junk DNA, and you know, I'll just say it right here that James Watson 
was kind of an asshat by saying that in the first place. Um, because on the he was in essence trying to criticizing Barbara McClintock's work on transposons, and she was making the case that they are doing interesting and important and programmed things. Now she was not correct about the way they program gene expression, but the way we think about what we call mobile elements right now is that they are in essence parasitic. They're trying to, they're being selfish genes that are living and residing in other larger host organisms, uh, trying to do their own thing. And, but what's interesting is that they end up becoming a very important source of genetic variability, right? So when you hear someone like the Discovery Institute or Michael Behe saying, oh, we can't explain evolution through point mutations, you just turn around and say to them, dude, there are lots of other ways of getting mutations, including chromosome rearrangements and junk DNA and pseudogenes. And these are all things that, not junk DNA, you, you just tell them mobile DNA and say, these are all parts of genetic variation. So there are lots of examples of what we call mobile elements that have ultimately become important for evolutionary adaptations. So I hope that answers your question, Vic. Um, you know, we'll see. So tagline just says, you know, messing with female mosquitoes and messing up maybe a food source for other organisms in the ecosystem. How bad is that? People have actually studied that. So the fact is there are very few, well, they hypothesized there are very few and they couldn't see this when they did the studies where any given predator of mosquitoes was exquisitely adapted to one type of mosquito. Again, remember, malaria is only transmitted by Anopheles. And so eliminating a particular species of mosquitoes has, is largely inconsequential to the larger ecosystem. So I think that that's an important point to make. But people have studied, because people have raised that question before. I think that's an important one. Um, let's see. Yeah, Watson was an asshat, Aurora. He really was. Um, oh, you're being sarcastic. Yeah, you've read about him too. Um, let's see. There was another question I think Vic had, which was, or George. Um, oh yeah, this was the question I was trying to find. Do we know which recessive traits that can be turned off that might not otherwise come in handy in future evolution? And so this is the other kind of more basic research area that you know, it's, it's foundational. It's not directly trying to lead to therapies, but the basic idea um, is that in the lab, you can use Cas9 to do lots of mutagenesis, random mutagenesis, semi-targeted mutagenesis, make model versions of gene, understand stuff that's not already known, right? It's a discovery phase. So I think that's an important use of this. It's not something that I would say was a big highlight there wasn't anything that came out of that this year that was really big. But, you know, the idea of using base editors or CRISPR-Cas9 to create genetic variation and then just see what you get out of it, you know, in model organisms is, is, is a big area that is going on. Um, is that a question for me, Day, about the dinosaurs? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think we'll probably never really be able to do that unless we could actually get a sequence of an ancient um, dinosaur's DNA. Oh, so Baragon, I think, is pointing out, I use a jargon term accidentally, which is a model organism. And the idea of that is, you know, humans, there's lots of complications in terms of doing experiments on them. Uh, as a whole organism in particular. They're expensive, there's review, there's ethics. Uh, so, but however, because we share ancestry, we share genes and in a lot of different ways, that things like C. elegans and nematode, fruit flies, mice, um, even yeast are model organisms that we understand how gene function works in those, and then we can use that to translate into how human genes work as well. So yeah, thanks for catching me on that one. Yes, even zoo flies. So. Um, oh, actually, like in the plant world, you know, there's some people who use switchgrass because it's easier to work with than say 
corn or rice or uh, wheat. Uh, and then you can try and translate what you learn from an organism into the actual product. Oh, okay, so George is um, refi or focusing on this question, which was, my mutation question was in regards to us eating vegetation that received gene editing. Again, the nice thing about most plant editing, as compared to say human cell therapies and trials, is um, it's very feasible to, and that's what the study from Young et al. was showing, you can do the edit you want in a plant, and you can actually, to some degree, be as messy as you want. You can actually have extra stuff insert in the genome. You can have extra edits. But with plants, you can always back cross it. And that's what you almost always do. You back cross it several times and then do an analysis to make sure that extra stuff or mutations did not occur. And so anything that, go, even though, in a sense, gene edited plants in the US regulatory scheme aren't considered GMOs in terms of those regulations, you still have to do the due diligence for any product you release to the market um, that it is what you say it is. And so the idea of, oh, we edited this, but we didn't make other, we didn't create other things or leave, you know, some DNA in here in other places, that all is still in effect. And that is something any good company would keep track of anyway. Okay, so I hope that answers that question. See you, Sister G. Thanks for coming. All right, thanks for coming, Violet. Uh, yeah, any other questions before we move on? I think I'm um, glad you enjoyed it. I hope it's a good summary. Uh, the slides will be available. And again, the thing about CRISPR is so popular now that if there are some like minor questions you have, there are YouTubes, there are other resources, lots of good stuff. <laughs> oh, okay, so maybe this is a good place to end. Um, And actually there's a, they also clarified a question. So let me actually, let me go back to Day's question. Then I'll ask, what, what do I predict next? So Day wanted to just meant, in terms of like reverse engineering or trying to get dinosaurs, the idea of trying to reverse engineer a bird, because we know that those are ancestors of dinosaurs to try and try to regress it into a dinosaur. To me, the thing about genomes is that there's so many little parts of it that have to do with regulatory schemes, right? humans only have 22,000 or so genes. And it's not how many genes we have, it's when we turn them on, when we turn them off, maybe what splice variants we make. And that's really hard to understand from just looking at sequence. And so trying to recreate the um, developmental process by reverse engineering a bird into a dinosaur means you have to get all those correct. So I think that that's for her. Now, if you can find enough mutations that say remove the beak, that create teeth, you could, in a sense, descend a dinosaur from a chicken, but that's not really, I think, the, the idea of going back and recreating dinosaurs. So let me finish, I'll finish, no more questions. I'll finish with this last good question, which is what next and what do I predict maybe for the upcoming years? Um, you know, I think clinical trials will be shown to be effective. That CRISPR-Cas9 editing works and that um, some of these will hit phase two, and I think in particular for cancer immunotherapy, there's going to be a lot of exciting, exciting, exciting therapies that happen with that. Uh, in terms of plants, we're expecting a lot more of these to get released in limited release. Um, there's lots of good, interesting mutations that are benefits to farmers and consumers. You know, my long-term prediction would be 30 or 40 years from now, the difference in the new types of products we'll have on the store shelves will be like the difference between the early 1900s to the late 1900s. And so I think there's that's something to look forward to. The problem with uh, 
agriculture and livestock is that Europe has basically said, we're going to regulate genome editing like it's regular genetically modified organisms. And so that is really slowing down the progress of what people are excited to try and do and release as a, you know, profit making product. Um, you know, I think, but I think the fact that we have these other new tools, I think we might be seeing people explore more with trying to change gene expression profiles of things that have some degree of effect. You know, people who have kidney problems happily go spend, I mean, not happily, but that's, they are willing to go spend hours a week in a dialysis center in order to receive a treatment. And so the idea of having some sort of therapy that might be high cost and you have to get over and over, but is known to be a lot safer and it's not germline editing, that might be a feasible pathway for certain types of things. So anyway, that being said, sorry, I can't be more specific, but it's really hard to predict the future. And I think that CRISPR-Cas9, with the complications of how we think about germline editing and the ethics of that, and the regulatory schemes and agriculture and human trials, very complicated. All right, okay, so I think with that, what I will do is close out my voice chat, and I might do a couple things in local chat, but otherwise I'm gonna close out, close out voice. Thank you all again for coming and your attention and listening. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, you know, just contact me later. And again, I want this to be an annual thing. So hopefully it'll be a CRISPR year in review 2020, 21, 22, et cetera, et cetera.